audience member in uh, Bushwick, Brooklyn, which as I live in Park Slope and I, I generally tend to not believe that anything good happens in Bushwick. Um, <laughs> but uh, I was proven wrong. Um, I attended this uh, astonishing performance uh, uh, at a um, at a converted, what would you call it? What, what is the space? It's a, it's a converted warehouse, a like converted an old warehouse. industrial space. Uh, and it, it was a, it was a piece, oh, you're supposed to use your microphone here. Oh, the, uh, before we get started, I have to, I've been told that for those of you watching on HowlRound, the live stream, that if you have any questions for us today, uh, you can uh, tweet them using the hashtag CNPS16. Uh, that's Colorado New Play Summit 16. Um, so uh, I saw uh, your latest uh, production uh, it, uh, called The Grand Paradise. And, um, you know, we're going to get into sort of the idea of, 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 of what what it is that you do, uh, but I just wanted to explain my experience briefly so that we so that we start with my my reason for being here, right? And and, and because um, I I'm used to creating theater, I'm used to being in the audience as a, as a creator of theater, I'm used to being in the audience as a, as a, as an attendee. Uh, but this was an amazing experience for me because I was uh, asked uh, to be uh, a participant in the in the event. I was asked to um, in some ways be an actor as well. Um, I was asked to be um, uh, complicit in the events that transpired. Uh, it was not a passive experience. And I realized that the performance I was seeing uh, to a degree was only as good as I was willing to allow it to be for myself. Mm -hmm. and, and that is something that you rarely get in theater. Um, and uh, that was for me, I came away from that really energized and, and really excited to talk to you guys. So I'm, I'm uh, uh, with that. Um, I I want to just sort of begin our conversation by by talking about uh, before we even get into specifically your work by talking a little bit about what it is. Uh, how can we define for for our audience here, um, for the audiences in Denver and for the people watching on HowlRound, what it is? How would you? How do you define? Um, Immersive theater. Do you call what you do immersive theater? What do you refer to? Experiential theater? Sometimes. Uh, well, here. let me, uh, to explain the, uh, the piece that Matthew just saw. Uh, so this is a project that we just opened in New York called The Grand Paradise. Um, and in the middle of Brooklyn, we've made a 1970s era tropical resort. Um, and we're sort of booking it like that. Like, come to, come to paradise, you go through an airline terminal you kind of get onboarded, and then you find yourself in, uh, for those in Denver, uh, something that may look a little bit like Casa Bonita. Um, <laughs> I grew up in Denver. Um, I interned at the DCPA, um, and so things like Casa Bonita are deep, deep in my psyche. Uh, uh, and Tom grew up in Florida, and so there's all manner of theme parkiness, and we can talk about a lot of that, and the inspiration for that is Vision Fever for that project. But basically what happens is there are 60 audience members who come to this tropical resort. They are greeted by a flowered garland um, and cute cabana boys in really short shorts. Um, and you find yourself transported to another time and place. Um, and then pretty immediately thereafter, you realize that you have the agency to be able to explore this resort. You can go to the beach. You can go to the mirror ball discotheque. Um, you can go to any of these things. And you may find yourself in uh, intimate encounters with performers. You may find yourself alone in a room with a performer who is not just doing a scene for you, but doing a scene with you. I'm having a conversation with you. Um, and while it is, while sometimes people feel like they are, they are asked to be actors in it, more often than not, we ask, actually just ask you to be yourself um, and to have a conversation with us, to, to think about this. Um, you know, and maybe to go along with sort of some of the strange little journeys that we go on. Um, and sort of over the course of this evening, um, 60 audience members experience uh, as many as 20 simultaneous scenes. No one, it is impossible for anybody to see the same show. Um, no one sees all of the same content. And so at the end of it, you walk it like if we had gone together, Matthew may have seen something vastly different than I, than I did. Um, and so that's, that's sort of a jumping off point for, you know, what this conversation about, what is immersive theater, or what is, what is it that we do? Do you want to talk a little bit more about um, I can this? Try, I can 
Can I try? Uh, I think when we start talking about immersive theater, sometimes it's like um, easier to talk about what we do than than the whole field because um, it gets defined both by the song and by the parts, and I think that the parts are doing really, really different things. Um, immersive theater, as I understand the way it's been labeled and why it's been labeled, is um, sort of classify an experience, something that is tactile and something that is like a 360 degree world that wraps around its audience. And I think most of the immersive theater or experiential theater, which is sometimes called, I mean, it, it depends on who's calling it that, but um, the, uh, I think the leading characteristics are that, that it's environmentally based, that you're in the middle of it as an audience. And then to some degree, some degree more or less, you have some, some of your own agency within those worlds. So you're making some choices about how you experience it. The, the audience models that I've seen work really well are some where um, you know, it's about anonymity and you're given license, like in the punch drunk works with no more, you're given a mask and they, they can get hundreds of people in the door and you're, you're sort of free to go wherever you want and you have, you have all the choices you can, you can follow. Um, follow a character, follow a room, stay in one place, and the experience can be very, very different for you, depending on what you choose to do. For us, um, our agenda is is more about intimacy and, and, and crafting an audience experience a little bit more invisibly and also um, with, with very fragmented narratives, but also really connective art for our audience. So, more, more often than not, we start with them in mind, and we say, "What do we want this audience experience to be?" And ultimately, like, how do we get, how do we get there? So, scene building happens with the audience in mind, and, and the scene actually can't happen without the audience. So, we bring in test audiences very early on, and we um, we really craft it with that idea that that, it, that it's going to be about what this person's experiencing. And I think, you know, when you say you were invited to be a part of it, that's true, and it can't happen without you. So it, it's meant to be a responsive model, and we're still going to lay on the scene. Like, the scene has certain parameters around it. The piece has certain parameters around it. You have agency in some areas, and then in others, you're very invisibly guided. And I think that the structure, um, the structure for us wants to always remain invisible, but you want to feel that we're responding to you or to anyone that comes into these scenes. And so there, there's, there's a... Maybe we'll talk about this later. There, there's also a different performance technique that, that gets employed in this type of world because as, a, as an actor, you get to, um, you get to uh, define the scene and, and you still have to get somewhere by the end, but you have a palette of responses. Um, for whatever an audience choice might be, you can honor it and then you can still get them where you need them to go. Uh, yeah, you know, what, what, what was so fascinating to me in, 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 in my experience watching Grand Paradise was... Uh, uh, and experiencing Grand Paradise was, um, I I had to learn that it was okay to yeah. be a part of this mm -hmm. thing, um, even as 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 as, as open minded to anything as I like to believe I am. There is, I think, in anyone, unless you're just like, unless you walk in completely like gung ho, ready to tackle this thing and take it on. I, I found myself going, oh wow, this is there's a lot going on around me, and and I have agency. I mean, that is such an amazing experience as an audience member to know. I, I mean, when you see any production of any play, you don't have, the, unless you're that guy at, at Hand of God who decided to go plug his cell phone in yeah. on the set, um, you don't really have a lot of ability to explore the set, to explore the world of the play. You are, you, are, um, you know, the, the, the ancient model is you sit there, we present it, we respond, and we're done. Um, with this, I was invited into rooms with just three other audience members. I was invited into rooms with one other actor. There was an entire, there were scenes that were played just for me. And what I mean by, and I think you, you, you um, refined my statement about being an actor, I became a scene partner yeah. in, in, the, in the event. I, I, um, and what happened to me in my experience watching, watching the piece over time was that I really... Um, once I found that I was oh, that I was being taken care of, once I found that there, there, that everything was being done for my benefit, for my, for my, um, my viewing pleasure, for my, for my learning, for whatever, I was able to just absolutely let you take me on a journey in a way that I don't remember the last time that happened to me at, 
any play, as much as I loved any particular play I may have seen, um, it stayed with me and it kind of haunts me actually. There are moments because these moments I know, unlike you know, we always say about theater, it, you know, every, it's different every night, depending on where you sit in the audience, the experience you have, but it's still the same play every, every night. Um, and in this, like you said, there is no, every, every moment in this is a, is, is a unique uh, moment. And, and in instance, some instances, it was my own private moment that only I know about and the actor sharing it with me. And so I've taken this experience away from me and I've, I've, it's been a week, week and a half since I've seen this. I keep, I can't stop thinking about it. And, and, and that's, that I, for me, that's, that's the mark of success as a, as a theater artist. Let's talk a little bit about um, Then She Fell, which is the first piece uh, that, I, I don't know if that's the first piece you did in New York, but it's certainly the first piece that, that, um, that, that gained you some attention and, 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 um, and um, put you on the map, as they say. Right. Um, wh what was the genesis of that project? And, and can you explain that for those of us who may not know what that is? Yeah, um, and I'm gonna go a kind of long way around that, but um, uh, I think it's also important to talk a little bit about how this type of work appears um, for a group of artists. Um, we didn't start out wanting to make this kind of work. We kind of didn't even know what we were doing. Um, once upon a time in um, 2001, um, in we, you know, we had all graduated from college. Uh, third Rail Projects was, at that point, Third Rail Dance. We were doing more sort of, the first thing that you do when you come out of college, producing repertory works in, uh, uh, in a rented space. Um, you know, sort of doing little, uh, little projects around the city. And at a certain point, we started asking ourselves the question, um, who, who are our audiences, mm -hmm. you know? Um, we, we felt, a, in some cases, a little bit like we might be preaching to the choir. Um, and there were a couple opportunities that afforded us the chance to start making work outside of traditional spaces, to start creating site-specific work. Um, and it was, I think, that that really sort of spun us off in, in a direction that sort of inevitably led us to where we are now, um, where we were exploring these non-traditional performance spaces, whether it was the lobby of the Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian, where Tom did his first piece, the first site-specific work that Third Rail ever did, or the South Street Seaport, um, you know, in the middle of happy hour, um, where I did a piece called Hope and Anchor. Um, we were looking at these, we were looking at these spaces, understanding what the architecture was, trying to listen to who are the people who come here, what are they doing here, what are, and what might we be able to offer them, as opposed to just like showing up and like farting at them, because nobody <laughs> likes that, right? Um, <clears throat> so, how can, we create an, how can we create an offering that fits into this space, that uses this space, that responds to this space and asks questions of it? Um, and then we sort of continued working in this way, refining a lot of the techniques that we, that we work with. Um, and in parallel, we became really interested in creating large-scale installations. Um, installations in some cases where an audience member is able to go through um, and explore, sort of like a museum. Um, and so you might be able to open up a drawer and find out more about a story. And sort of the, fir the more that you dig, the more you can honor the story, um, sort of like object theater. Um, and so those two, those two interests really started converging for us. And then I think the final piece of the puzzle is, it's kind of a question that we keep asking, is how do you, re how do you recontextualize an audience's relationship with performance? How can we... How can we how can we mess with that, especially in um, you know the wake of the digital age that we're in right now, um, where we find ourselves so separated from other human beings, um, where we are able to get whatever content we want on our on the crazy computer that's in our pocket. Um, you know what are the things that performance might need or want to do right now, um, and for all of those reasons, we sort of found our way to the the sort of initial creation of Then She Fell. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about what that piece is? Um, um, then she fell was the first time we really truly decided to synthesize all the ways we had been working um, and fully integrate all of those aspects in terms of the visual um, site-specific work on real-world architecture, the idea of um, ephemera being part of the story, the objects within the world, the world itself, the art installation, like really bringing all that together. And we knew that it would be a fun
fun experience, but we were we were questioning like the the way in which we would put the story together and people would relax into it and not feel like I'm gonna miss out on something or I'm not getting the narrative or whatever because we knew it would be inherently fragmented and and in some ways work within the dream logic and um, so we decided in <clears throat> for the first time ever and the only time ever to use an existing source because mostly we devise our own from our personal stories because our lives are weird enough so um, we we thought what can we use that would have um, you know, cultural capture kind of everywhere. And we, we were actually in Hong Kong on the rooftop talking to someone when this this sort of was born, and she was like, oh, you should go with Lewis Carroll because, you know, everyone knows Lewis Carroll. And I was like, I don't really like Lewis Carroll very much, but, you know, everyone thinks I'm obsessed, or we're all obsessed, but we're not, I don't think. No. Okay, great. Uh, so we, we were like, well, that, that would be really interesting because then we could hook our narrative into something that has cultural signifiers, and people could relax. They would go into a room and if they were asked to paint roses with a white rabbit, that wouldn't have to be explained. You would know the consequences of that already. So we could go, we could go even further into psychological space, and we could really push this. And so we we started looking at it, and we and then we got really excited. We were like, oh my god, wow, his his life was way more complicated than than I thought. And you know, he had a real life relationship with his family, and this real Alice, and and there's missing pages from a diary of some event that happened. So um, it started getting really juicy. And we looked at um, this idea, Zach, Zach had actually, this is the vision keeper on this one, and, and Zach was really um, thinking along the lines of duality and uh, split sort of agendas and, and mapping that out. And we were looking at the two works, the two primary works, um, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. And, and they both, ha they happen on either side of whatever this real life event was. And so the first one was very much about um, you know, this idea of a child in an adult world and it making no sense. And, and it's based on the logic of chance, it's card game. And, and the second one is based off the logic of chess and it's very much driven. There's a program here, there's, there's, there's a strategy to it. And so for me, that's where I started getting really excited because that was like the psycho babble stuff that I was really into. And, um, and so I, I think thematically that all kind of merged with like the work we were doing, this really rich kind of real life story and, and the, two, the two very different agendas within these books and then the ability to have a fragmented narrative and make lots and lots of room for our audience to see whatever they want to see in it. And this is where we started talking about the work as a Rorschach and, and what it means to make space for your audience so that um, whatever they need to see, whatever they want to see, it's, it's framed for them and they can, they can have whatever takeaway. And, and how many, can you talk about what this actual structure of them should is, if you know what it is? Oh, um, yeah, okay. So these are, for those of you who did not hear, uh, the question was um, explaining the structure, the physical structure of how them should tell work, what, what the uh, audience mm -hmm. experiences. And also I think, also talk about like, I think this is a great way to transition as well into the idea of how you begin to put these things together. Um, the, the process of writing, devising, rehearsing these, these pieces. I'll start with the structure and I'm gonna bounce with you okay. for that. Um, the, the structure is, is very intimate. It's eight performers and 15 audience members. And it's in a three story building in Williamsburg, um, Brooklyn. And it, it's actually running simultaneously with the new show. So it's been going for three years now. Um, and it's, you know, that was the thing that we walked into it knowing that we wanted to make it an intimate experience. For two hours you would go into this world and you would feel like it was there just for you and you were the only one sometimes, and you, often you are the only one in a room with a performance. Um, and so that, that became the really driving mission of, of the audience model of the work, was like how, how to keep it in this tight form so that everything is about you. And, uh, and that led us to the, um, the way in which we built it, which you can talk about. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that was the thing that kind of blew my mind as a theater maker was early on in this process, we knew that we wanted to create a show that was decidedly intimate, which was, uh, which was a, in some way about the audience. Um, you know, and as a good theater maker, like I kept on asking, like, what's the major dramatic question? Who's the... Who is the protagonist in this piece? 
Um, and at a certain point, I think we all realized that the audience was the protagonist, mm. um, which blew my mind. <laughs> um, uh, but then that affords all of these really exciting possibilities that if, if, if our audience is the protagonist, then it's actually their journey that's the most important. So what is the exposition that they need to get? What are the little hooks of information that they need to find? Um, and then how do we create enough space for them to go on kind of whatever journey they want to? You know, Because we, anytime we come to the theater, we are looking through our own lenses. Um, and so then how can, we, how can we create scenes in which there's space for you to really look through your own lens? Um, so you can, you can read whatever you want to read need to read um, throughout these sort of fragmented moments. Um, I would kind of like to talk about it as our job being that we, we're we supposed to create these series of dots, hopefully really interesting dots, um, and the audience's job is to connect those dots. Um, but what that means is that everybody who comes out of the show has a vastly different picture, right? You know, they're all the same dots, but you've connected them this way, you've connected them this way. Um, it's great to hang out outside of like Ben Chappelle. Um, and listen to someone walk out and be like, that was a sh story about like the subjugation of women in Victorian times, and, and I was really moved by it. And somebody else was like, no, that was a story of lost love. And somebody else is like, no, that's a story of this. And they're all right, is the thing. Which was the other thing that blew my head as a, a, as a theater maker, is that like, actually my job isn't to tell the story. My job is to create the opportunity for the audience to tell their own story. And, and that's the thing that's most important. So how do you build that? Yeah, well, I think we're still figuring that out. Um, but it, it really is about kind of what Tom said, uh, thinking about what the experiences that we want the audience to have are. Um, and then and then playing with that. We, we I, want, I want to, because I think this is a really interesting, and I do want but I just want the audience to know, like I want to describe for them briefly the experience I had at Grand Paradise. And, and so they get a, a sense of like one individual person's journey through that story. And then I want to find out from you, like, really talk about the rehearsing thing, yeah. the rehearsing thing. So, so I show up at this, at this place, I get my airline ticket. I'm, I'm, I, we are, we are sent into this small room where the, a video plays and it is the standard, um, video in which you get the, uh, safety guidelines for your flight. Um, wonderful, well-made video. I love that was incredible, uh, touch. Uh, and then you walk into this big room and there's how many of us are there? It's 60. There's 60 people. And, um, the performance begins um, with, I, as I understood them, they're a family, and they arrive, um, and um, uh, they, ch they check in, and you're there with them. You, you've been given, you've been given uh, flower bar lays, and you are, uh, you are instantly, I, I just had taken um, my honeymoon in, in Hawaii just like a month ago, so I'm, I'm like, oh, this is, I, I know that. <laughs> um, and, um, I, and then the performance begins it kind of already has started, but then it begins, and uh, you realize you're you're told you know don't open any doors that are closed. Um, uh, but other than that, you're free to, to roam. Uh, and um, once things were underway, I, we I just realized I I could go anywhere, and I was like, okay, what do I want to look at? And I and and there was a beautiful uh, room that was sort of like behind a, a window, which was like a woman's boudoir, and it was. Um, and it, I could look at it through the window. It was almost like a very voyeuristic experience. Um, there's a bar off to the side, there's the beach, and I just started to wander. And, and uh, I, I'm actually telling this wrong. After the beginning of the, 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 the performance, I was invited to join um, a smaller group of, of audience members, and we went into another room, and, and, and the performance for us started to break down from this group of 60 to this group of maybe like, six or seven, and then I was broken down into a smaller group of three, and we were all just started to be fragmented. And then there were moments when I was allowed to s free roam around this, and that's when I was looking in the, in the boudoir and, and, and at, the, at the beach and at that. And then eventually, at some point, someone came up to me and said, follow me. And they like took my hand and they led me somewhere. And I had, um, there was a scene just for me with another actor, and I was, I was, uh, in, you know, involved in, in the telling of that story, and then I was able to roam some more, and then I was invited elsewhere. And, and what was amazing to me um, in the experience was both my ability to determine for myself what my experience would be, and your and your company's 
um, very, and I mean this in the best way, calculated uh, way of funneling you into the storyline as, as you needed me to experience it. Um, the crowd control, which never ever felt like crowd control. Um, and, and there were some, there were some moments. There was a moment in, in Grand Paradise. Can I tell this? Is this okay to is give this the, 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 the bedroom scene? Uh, sure. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to give away any secrets. No, 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 um, um, I was invited into a bedroom and I, I and this, and this, and this young woman and I were in this bedroom and I was asked to pick a record. It was a Linda Ronstadt record that I, that, that I, I mean, I didn't pick Linda Ronstadt. I was just luck of the draw. Uh, maybe I picked Linda Ronstadt. And, um, <laughs> And you're in this like rundown hotel room, and it it both feels very intimate and dangerous, but in a safe way and exciting. And I was fascinated about what was going to happen next, you know. And and that never happened. And then I was led into another room where I had my palm read, and I was led into a room where I was talking. Someone was talking about our astrological signs, and 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 it was, and, and there was something cumulatively beautiful about about the entire thing and I realized walking out that yes indeed I had uh, an experience that no one else has ever will ever have at, at that the, the, the chance the infinite chance have you ever figured out the mathematical possibilities of no, someone actually ha having the exact same experience oh, yeah I mean I, so it leads me to my, it leads me to my question and then and, and then I'm gonna shut up um, it did cause me to realize that this must be um, there are multiple there were so there are scenes that go on in the play that I didn't get to see they were happening simultaneously as I was maybe in that bedroom having a pillow fight with this woman no kidding um, <laughs> listening to Linda Rodstadt um, uh, uh, and I realized there these are all happening simultaneously and the other thing that was amazing to me is uh, it wasn't until the end when we all regrouped that I, I had forgotten that there were 60 of us doing this thing I, I, I there were moments when I felt I was the only person at this thing or I was one of four. Uh, every all the participants evaporate, and that and 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 what was left was me and the performers and the experience we were having. And so, um, I know it's sort of dangerous to to sort of like dissect the magic, but I am so fascinated by the nuts and the bolts. I'm a theater maker too, and I'm I'm fa I was like half of my brain was split by like this is wonderful. How the hell did they do this? Um, so how the hell did they do it? Like what? How many unique um, scenes are there? How do you have to? I, I'm curious about the schematics of it. Do you write it? Do you do you, do you have a big like? Are you like are you like General Patton with like a big map and you're like looking at like how this thing works? Um, yes, all of those things. Um, uh, you know, and it's also it it is radically different for every project. Um, a lot of it is um, is what is the what is the experience that we want the audience to have, not only individually but collectively. Um, for Then She Fell, we did a lot of figuring out on how, how, to, how to create this series of events for an audience um, that had both, that would provide both a satisfying aesthetic and narrative arc regardless of in what order you might see scenes or what scenes you saw, what scenes you didn't, um, but also had a degree of randomness and chance um, because that was important to the, to the work. Um, for this, uh, how do you how do you create a how do you create a structure that affords the audience the opportunity to to explore a resort like right you go on vacation and you want to look around and see all this stuff how do you how do you get a chance to do that and then how do you get a chance to decide where you want to go and then be able to have a satisfying journey wherever you decide it um, and so it really depends on on the project how that structure gets made. Um, and it involves a lot of spreadsheets. It involves a lot of maps of the space. It involves a lot of wandering around. Um, and very often it involves the entire cast um, being in all of the various spaces of the, of the theater, practicing sort of, well, what happens if you're doing this over there and I'm doing <coughs> this over there? Okay, everybody shift. Um, and you, know, you were talking about this. Very often our rehearsal process is um, is sort of strange in that we will rehearse a 15 minute, a 15 second transition for four hours. Or four days. Or four <laughs> days. Um, because we want it to be invisible. Because we want the audience to not know that they are, 
that they are being moved from one space to another. Um, and in fact, to make it feel like it is, it is their choice to move from one place to the other. Um, um, there's, there's two things there. Uh, we work very differently than most groups already, even if we weren't doing immersive theater. So there's, there's three of us who direct the company, who are two artistic directors, and we have really, really different aesthetics that most often get along. Um, and so we actually rotate through on projects. We, we always work collaboratively, and we always co-write, co-author, co-choreograph, co-direct. We share all of it, um, but we, we kind of rotate through who is, who is what we call vision keeper on a project, and that is usually the person that comes forward with the initial idea or the structure. And so Zach was that on uh, Then She Fell, I was that on Brand Paradise, and um, in between those two, our um, third co-artistic director, Jean Willette, was doing um, this touring piece, and it was the first time we'd ever toured, and we wanted to do something like, we're site-specific artists, but how do you tour that because it's different in every site? So we got a pop-up camper, and we made that our site, and we just kind of hauled it around the, everywhere we could. Um, and so just, I can speak a little bit more specifically about the structure of Grand Paradise, because it was a riff off of that, where Janine was developing the narrative of this family unit that was under pressure, on vacation, frightening each other crazy, coming of age, or having a midlife crisis all at the same time. Um, this, this family needed to end up somewhere, and I was thinking, oh man, what if they ended up in my hometown or something like that, you know, like that would really undo them. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm from St. Augustine, Florida, and there's all Are you really? Of, yeah, yeah. I'm from City, Florida. <laughs> oh, so you know, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we have a fountain of youth, and I thought, well, that would, be, that, would, that would really add some drama to what these people are yearning for. And so I started thinking about how to build that world and where those characters would come from, and, and I'm really obsessed with, um, you know, the Clarissa Pinkola's piece and Women Who Run With The Wolves, and that idea that a story is, every story is a single psyche, and that every aspect of that story, every character in that story represents some conflicting aspect of the psyche, and it's like, okay, that's where my pantheon's coming from. So all the people at this resort are some, some sort of mythological manifestation of an archetype, and um, they all have something to offer, kind of Mr. Rourke style, Fantasy Island style, mm -hmm. for this family, and the family becomes the structure. So these five people come in, and um, you only get two-fifths of the structure when you come to the show, and it, it benefits from sort of repeat visits. It's a marketing idea. <laughs> um, and, uh, anyway, so the way we organize that in the more, um, the more like curated portions of the show, where you're actually kind of invisibly led along, um, follow, follow one of their journeys, and you're meant to, to have a synonymous experience with that character in those moments. So they're, uh, you know, we talk about like you, you don't be scared of this work. Like you, we're not going to make you be an actor in it. That's not, that's not how it works. But whatever, wherever you are, and whatever you're experiencing, we sort of meet you there. Mm -hmm. um, so, and and then these family members sort of act as avatars in a way for for that experience, and they get to go a little further into the scary places we might not take you, but we might take you into other scary places that they don't go. So um, it, that, that kind of gave the central framework for this. And then on top of that, because Zach had crafted the structure of Then She Fell very, very meticulously. I mean, it's almost a chess game that you enter. And um, we wanted to have like some release around that. So it's framed on on multiple sides by this free range stuff that you're talking about where you get to go and make your choices. And often that leads you to the curated path that you're, you don't know you're going down, but something that is attracting you, this character is really interesting, or this, right. some, some loud noise in the bar and some woman just dove off a thing, so I'm gonna run to that. that happened, there was a fight at one point yeah. for a paradise in the bar. That'll, That'll get you in trouble. Like, yeah, it, I, it. I doubt it, like, I'm following that down. <laughs> I wanna know what's going on there. Uh, and then I guess probably, Steal my fate for the rest of the evening. Yeah, um, I wanted to touch on. I, I want to stay a little bit on because I have a question about like rehearsing and. and but uh, uh, the the one thing you said, you know, the the idea of we are not asking the audience to be actors, but we are asking the audience. The, the it, I hate I hate when the house lights come up and the actors come into the audience. Well, I freeze up. I'm like, no, no. Um, uh, I but you know that is sort of like things that happen 
with you and what you're doing is something that is for you. It is, it is, it is, it is, um, there is a generousness uh, of, of, about the performance. It, it is, and, 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 and for me, I, it was very, um, I, I mean, it's almost very flattering, you know? You're like, oh wow, you're paying attention mm -hmm. to me, you know? That I, you, you as an audience member feel very special in ways that you don't it, usually. Um, and, um, but I do wanna, I, I wanna go back to the rehearsing and then I do wanna transition into what, we're, what you guys are here doing now. But the one thing that is fascinating to me is how do you, how, what's, what's the process? And I just wanna stick with, uh, with Grand Paradise because it's the one that I know. Um, how do you rehearse it? Do you rehearse in a rehearsal space before you take over the, 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 the actual space? And then the, that space being so multi, you know, faceted and there's so many rooms, how do you how how do you actually literally like how do you rehearse it? How do you corral it when there are actors? You can't be everywhere at once. Right. Like with that, how did it start in the room, and then how were you able to move into the space? Um, well, so we knew that we were making this piece, uh, the Grand Paradise, which wasn't named the Grand Paradise for a really long time, um, but we knew it was about this place, this um, this sort of mythical place, this place that was offering. Um, offering whatever people might be longing for, you know, the pleasures of youth, maternity, whatever. So we started thinking about um, the devising process for that really was, um, we we don't rehearse in a rehearsal studio, actually that's not, it's almost counterproductive to what we do because we, we climb on furniture, we climb up the walls, we make, uh, we respond to architecture. Um, and so a, a, an empty rehearsal studio is, at least for me, terrifying. Um, and so we were uh, we were on residency in Jeffersonville, New York, um, at this beautiful old house that um, was a converted mill, um, with all these weird little bedrooms and um, various spaces. And we started just riffing on some of these ideas, um, and starting off with, you know, what can we do with an audience member? What what are the experiences that we can provide for an audience member? Um, what are the, what is the most ridiculous thing you could do to an audience member? Um, <laughs> What and can't you do? What can't you do for, to an audience member? And then how do you do that in a way that is sort of loving and honoring and generous? And, and generous? Uh, you know, and so, um, you know, one of the things that actually happened was we were like, what can't you do with an audience member? You can't <laughs> kill them. Okay, let's figure out how to stage that scene. <laughs> you know? And so, like, how do you do that? Technically speaking, I witnessed that at the... Uh, yeah. Did right. you die? Yes. Did yeah. you die? What? Did you die there? I, I did not die, but... The person that I was with did. No. So, um, so we killed somebody. She's fine. Yeah, she's, she's fine. fine. <laughs> um, but, uh, but then we begin just figuring out what is that. And it's very often uh, we collaborate as directors, but we're also an ensembleist collaborative group. Um, many of our artists we've been working with for uh, 15 years, seven years. You know, we've, we've got a lot of people who we've been working with for a really long time. And, and so these these investigations we've we've sort of made as a group. Um, and so we often rehearse in non-traditional spaces in and sort of building scenes around the environments that they would actually be in. Um, and then we, we will often like set the score for a scene, bracket that, and then begin sort of collaging mm. the, other, um, the other experiences. And then from there we start stringing them together and mm -hmm. trying to figure out what is what is a satisfying movement through all of these things? Like, do you want to have a pillow fight and then do you want to die? Or do you want to die first and then do you want to have a pillow fight? Or, 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 you know, um, uh, where are the moments where you do want to be um, invited into into action? What are, what are the moments where you want to be able to be a voyeur and oversee something? What are the moments where you just kind of need theatrical white space? Um, to process whatever just happened to you. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to talk more about that? Well, here, here's a question then. Um, when you are, when, when the piece, because that makes a absolute sense, the, the creative process, which is just like with anything, it just starts as a little kernel and then it builds and then you build a, a molecule that's attached to that and then it eventually it just sort of grows and it becomes this thing and it, and it, it requires patience and, or, and just trial and error. I think a lot of people um, would, would would be shocked at how daunting it seems to be at the beginning of any any process creating either a written work or a production. Um, it is it is it's a 
painstaking and slow and, and, and a patient process. And I can only imagine that for what for you it must be it, 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 triple that. Um, do you then, when you bring your, your uh, do you take, do you become an audience member? Do you do the, do you do the experience so that you have an idea of what it's like for them? When, and do you do that with your test audiences as well? Do you take, do you do the show with your test audiences? Well, I, a lot of times, you know, when we're building these pieces, we're building something we call a one-on-one, right? So I've got this lifeguard and I've got to figure out what we're doing. Um, and so I, as a director, I'm also audience member in that moment, and we're, we're figuring that out together. And like, uh, one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves in this type of work is like, what is what am I doing during this? And it's like, here's a great idea, here's a great set of language, here's a great movement score, but, but as an audience member, what am I doing? How am I active in this? How am I being activated in this? And um, Why do I have to be there? Yeah, why, why am I necessary to this scene? And, and, it ha- and, and at the end of the day, that scene cannot work without me. So, so it has to answer all of those mm-hmm. questions. And when we were building this scene, we're like, well, what's, this lifeguard is a really funny guy. You know, he's so serious, he probably couldn't save anyone. <laughs> um, but he's really serious about it. He's like, well, why am I here? Okay, I'm here, to, I'm here to train. I'm here to train to be a lifeguard, you know, water safety. And, um, <laughs> and, and one of the questions was like, how do we get audience to go further than we've ever gotten them in this scene? Like, could we... Not even that they have to kiss the lifeguard by the end, but that they're willing to, mm. you know. And um, and if we can we can make them want that or be willing to, then 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 like yeah, we landed the scene. Um, so we're like, how do we get them to say yes right off the bat? And a lot of times we, we think, well, how do we gently earn trust? Mm. And this is what you said at the beginning it's of the so world key to this piece. Yeah, you're not you're not sure. You're suspicious. I'm the worst audience for this kind of thing because I don't want to participate. Mm-hmm. Like I I am I'm passive audience. Number one, um, which is funny that I make this kind of work, but um, I, you know, we're sort of thinking like, well, the first time you touch an audience member in this world, it has to be like a really easy kind of brokering of relationship, and you're listening to their comfort level on that. And if it's like not something that they're into, then then you know you guide them in a different way, you cue them differently. You can I jump in there? Yeah. Uh, you can, can I come back to the lifeguard though? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Like here's a really good. I'll make sure you get your yeah, lifeguard. Yeah, 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 you got my back. You know, okay. here, here's a moment of something that we've discovered. The first moment, like we we do touch our audience in in the pieces, um, because the you know very often our pieces are about these uh, these intimate moments, um, and and touch and that tactileness and the multisensoriness is really important. But one of the things that we discovered pretty early on was the first time that you touch an audience member, it has to be their choice. Like you don't like go up and grab somebody. If I need to take you to a scene, the first scene that you got taken to, the performer went like this. He extended his hand on the mic. Like and he and took that. Yeah. And it's and it's that that's important to our work, is that we, we create an offering and an opportunity, and then if you want to take it, you can, but you don't have to. Ha- have people decline? Yeah. Do people decline? Yeah. And then you just move on from there? Yeah, and right. then you honor them. Yeah. yeah. You're like, great. That's you incredible. Want, you don't want to I, you know, and, and, and the lifeguard story is definitely coming up. Um, the, the, what what happened to me, and, and I think what you talked about building trust with the audience was so important uh, from my experience, and it makes sense that, that that's an ethos for you because uh, by the time I got to the, the Linda Rodstad bedroom pillow fight pillow fight scene, um, I had already had enough of these sort of at least face to face intimate moments with the actors, and so now I'm in a bedroom with this woman, and at, after the pillow fight. She sits me down on the bed and she covers my face. She tells me to cover my eyes and not to peek. And I, being a very beautiful person, did not peek. And she changes out of her clothes into a, a bathrobe. And then she takes my hand down and she's changed clothes. And she sits down next to me on the bed and she holds my hand. And, and I'm like, at first, my instinct is to go, eh, eh, eh. and then I'm like, she sees my wedding ring, right? Yes, yeah, she sees it. And, and, <laughs> and, and and, and then she just holds my hand and she places her head on my shoulder. And then I just relax because you know what that scene for me was about? And yes, of course, there's, there, it's sexually charged. There's, you're in a bedroom with a woman. It's, 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 it's like, you know, you're, it's a tawdry bedroom too, you know? And, um, but it's about, there's just there's about this <coughs> moment of connection, you know? There's a moment of, 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 it's such a simple, lovely gesture of just 
resting your head on someone's shoulder. And then I responded in kind and I rested my head against her head. And we just sat there for a moment. And I think there is something incredibly, especially coming at a point when, when we have experienced at that point what we've experienced in, in, in the piece and, and the thinking that you cause us to do. I mean, because the play, the piece is also very philosophical and it causes you to, to think about uh, your, your life and, 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 and the meaning of your life and, and, um, and, and fate and, and, and destiny. Um, and, and so at this moment, you had completely earned my trust and I knew that I was safe. And I also knew that the actor was safe. And that was, you know, the other thing for me as a, as a, as a, as a theater maker, I, I was, um, I'm always like worried about the audience's safety. And then the audience would say, I don't care about the audience's safety. I worry about the actor's safety. And, and I was like, okay, this is a safe moment for, for both yeah. of us. And it was beautiful. Talk now, lifeguard, go. I can, I can do this. Um, actually, just to, to kind of pick from what you were talking about, bring back to this, the, the thing that's, um, you know how you can often land a great profundity by doing it through comedy? And like there's this, this thing that happens, especially in the Grand Paradise, where we raise an expectation or a, a discomfort level or um, titillation or whatever, but then we we're able to turn a corner on it and then land something that is much more profound out of it. And so in 99.9% .9 of our work, I would say we do it like there's an offering there's an incremental step there or the situation you walk into and you, you walk into this bedroom or you walk into this room and it's hot or whatever, you experience something immediately and then through through these incremental steps we get somewhere else and you're actually suddenly able to hear it in a way that you wouldn't if we had just gone straight for it. Mm -hmm. um, with the lifeguard, here it comes. So, so 0.1%, where it's just like, let's not earn trust. I don't think this guy's trustworthy. Let's just assume it and see what happens. So he gets you in there, and it's like, hey, you know, he's very bro-y about it. And like, you ready to do your training? Yeah. And you're like, okay, yeah, I'm going to do the training. Like, boom, his shirt comes off, and he hands you lotion. Get my back. And you're like, you don't have time to say no. Cool. And and too bad, because you've already said yes. So now you're going to keep saying yes to the rest of the scene. And, um, and, and what happens is he ends up get, getting you to this place where, where he actually lands some of the most profound thematics of, of that particular um track you know and uh and you're just like oh my god okay wow cool and you're you're like really with him and then i'm not going to tell you about the end but the, mm. the end's cool well and and um i want to i want to talk quickly about um uh, i have a couple more questions and um being mindful of time um uh the the ability to say no is so important mm -hmm. and 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 um and then you are only you, the experience that you have is only as as um meaningful as you allow it to be. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was in a group of four people and we were asked our astrological signs at one point and we all gave our astrological signs and, 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 and the actress was um, sort of riffing on what we, what we gave her and this one guy refused to give it to us. He was just like, no, I'm going to give you my astrological sign. And without missing a beat, she goes, oh, you're a Taurus. <laughs> <laughs> And then she continued to just do it as if you were a Taurus. And it was, and I, I, I the, um, there, there must be some comfort for them in the, in the, in the, 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 the rehearsing, in knowing what they're doing, but then there also must be an ability on your actor's part to just sort of like go with what the moment it gives you. Like how, uh, is it just a question of, of these, these actors being um, uh, used to this because they've worked with you before or do you find actors who, I mean, eventually you're just gonna need to trust that every night the actor is going to be able to need to think on their feet. Yeah. Can you, okay now, can you give me some great stories? Because yeah. we yeah. want to hear great stories yeah. about, about things going magnificently well, <laughs> like these beautiful, like, wow, we could never plan this moment. And then like, just, we want to hear the disasters too. Yeah. I can do at least one of the disasters. But the, yeah. in answer yeah. to your question, um, yeah, we are, the people who we work with um, have a really bizarre set of skills. Um, they are beautiful speakers. They are beautiful movers. They have the ability to climb up the wall and onto the ceiling, um, and they and they are quick witted. And they and I think the thing that's most important is um, that you want to be in a room with them, and they are in the room with you. Mm -hmm. um, that when they're when they're giving a monologue and they're talking, they're actually talking to you. They are seeing you, um, and that that being seen is so important and it's something you just can't teach. Um, uh, do you want to talk about magnificently wrong things? 
Well, okay. Um, I, I had to be in the show last week, right before I came out here, um, for eight shows as dad. And uh, there's a scene, and I didn't, you know, I've done several hundred performances in this type of work and um, learned all kinds of things, but wow, you learn something new every night. And this, this was kind of the coolest moment ever because we were, there's a scene where dad goes into the bar and, and we get to buy an audience member a drink and we get to talk to them and you're pulling out your wallet and you're looking at vacation photos and you're, you know, by the end of that, you're, you're getting a window into, into dad's sort of desperation for, for, you know, this vacation to, to bring something back. But we've, we've been playing. Most, most of the material is set, but there are little dials within what we're doing right now as the matrix of the piece is finding, finding its footing. And this is one of the scenes where dad keeps trying out little bits of new material every, every night to figure out what that palette of responses are because we're also learning what audiences will do. Mm -hmm. And as we learn what audiences will do, we develop you know, a palette of responses back to that. So you know, like, okay, they're gonna do one of five things. They're gonna refuse the drink, they're gonna really act with us, <laughs> or they're going to like shut down or whatever. And so, you know, and I, I have never really done a lot of improv, so I, I like to define things in little groups for myself. And I got into this situation the other night where I'm talking to this guy and uh, his girlfriend, <clears throat> and it was getting like too much pressure on me, so I threw it onto him. I was like, "Are you guys married?" No, uh, no. Like, uh, but you're here together, you know. And then, like, just to get it off of me, so I could like process for a second. And then we started talking about their vacations, and you know, this is circa 1969, the world that we're in. <clears throat> and uh, I said to him, "Oh, well, where would you two really like to go?" And he goes, "Burning Man." You know, I did four times. So I was like, "Burning Man." <laughs> but like I love that so much and then I became such a chatty Kathy through the rest of the show I was like I'm going to talk more to people you know but like bring that in a little bit too but I love those moments where audiences will also challenge you because mm -hmm. they're like let's see how in this you really are and when I was playing the white rabbit um, I had a scene one night where this woman was determined to get me to eat the flower and our job is to paint those flowers. We have three minutes to turn those things red and get out of that room. You know, and I'm, uh, uh, my rabbit is very middle management. He's, um, you know, <clears throat> he likes to have everything done well and fast. And um, So we're painting the roses, and she kept plucking off the petals and eating them. I'm like, okay, mm, demonstration, this is what we're doing. And I'm, I'm a firm believer, if somebody tries something three times, you've got to honor it. And after the third time she ate it, <laughs> I ate it. It was the like, most pesticide ridden thing I've ever tasted. <laughs> she was so happy about it. But um, I, I don't know. I, I just think like like that was a really great scene for her because she got to like win something in it. And, mm. and we still got where we were going. But like th that ability to like really hear people because I think that's what people come for. Yeah. It's a tactile world. It's a world where they can be seen and heard and honored and be in the room with you. And the more you can listen, yeah. I think the more profound the experience is for them. That's amazing. Um, that, yeah, that, that just fits in with what my experience was watching it. Uh, I, I feel like I want to go back 10 times. Um, I, 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 we are running a little short on time. I want to be able to a a open up to questions from the audience. I, I would love <coughs> to talk briefly before we do that, uh, and then we'll open it up to some questions. Um, what it is that you're working on? Um, here. <clears throat> so Third Rail um, and the GCPA are working together on a new immersive work, uh, a new immersive experiential, whatever you call this kind of thing. Um, whatever, whatever it is that, we're doing, that we do, we're doing it. Um, <laughs> um, and we're doing it here and we're doing it uh, with local artists. Um, we've, been, um, we've been blessed with the opportunity to come out, get a chance to meet several local artists and for the last week we've been building this work with them. Um, it is... Uh, the, the piece is going to happen somewhere in a warehouse, somewhere in Denver, um, and, uh, and the audience is going to arrive, find themselves, um, you'll, you'll see. Um, uh, but, but like all of our pieces, there is, there is an invitation, there is a facade that you find yourself going to, and then you may find yourself deeper in this world, in, in a world that is per, perhaps more, more of a dreamscape. Um, yeah, um, and, and a lot of the piece uh, is, is fundamentally about memory. Um, 
for a couple reasons. I, I grew up in Denver, and so the opportunity for me to make a work in Denver um, obviously has a lot, uh, is, is resonant personally. Um, and, you know, uh, this city is, is steeped in, in memory and nostalgia for me. Um, and that just sort of got me thinking about what, what is memory? How do we remember? Mm -hmm. um, what do we remember? What do we forget? What does it mean to forget? What does it mean to go through your life? And, uh, you know, and, and, and that thing where every time you remember something, you're not actually remembering it. You're remembering the last time you remembered it. <laughs> um, and so there is this spiral away from the actual event. Um, and, you know, no wonder people may have vastly different interpretations of the same event. Mm -hmm. um, and what does that mean for life? What does that mean for love? And when um, will they be able to see this? Uh, the piece is, um, it will be premiering in um, May of this year, I think May 20th. Um, and uh, you will find out more about it um, on both uh, Third Rail's website and the TCPA's website, um, and its website when it appears. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we've just been, we have been building these scenes and, and, and doing kind of exactly what we've been talking about at the panel. Like, there is a scene where wow, we just, it's really important to walk into, we, you know, you've all done this. Um, you walk into a couple's house and something is wrong. Um, <laughs> but they're being the consummate hosts, right? <laughs> um, and so like you walk in and you're like, oh no, what's happened? No, I don't want to, I don't want to set the table. So I just want to go home. But you're, you know, you right. find yourself complicit in this, um, in this sort of wonderful, terrible fight. You're doing an interactive Virginia Woolf, right? You can tell that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, oh, I. That would be awesome. Royalty, please. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, just as a, as a quick plug for it, the, the fact that this is happening in Denver is, is incredibly exciting. I, I can speak as an, as an audience member. You, you guys have no idea what you're in store for. This, this conversation has, has given you perhaps a glimpse of it. It, it is. Um, it's just an, 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 an amazing and unique opportunity, and I'm, I'm really excited that it's that it's happening here, and I can't wait to come out and see it. Um, we have about like maybe ten. I'm not being generous. Ten minutes left. I want to open it, be able to open it up to it, at least uh, a couple of questions. Does anybody have any questions? Right here. So the question is, uh, for the, those watching on HowlRound, the question is, uh, uh, how do you protect the actors from disruptive audience members? Uh, what, what happened to the example of, like I gave of, of, of being in the bedroom with that woman? I was very respectful. What if someone wasn't when someone grabbed the woman's breast? What if someone threw water in, a, in, a, in an actor's face? Um, what are the sort of the safety uh, controls for actors and, and, and are, have moments like that happen and how do you deal with that? Is there, and the other question was, is there a timeout mechanism? Uh, The play shuts down and we are, yes, and order is regained, yes. So um, that particular scene um, is probably the furthest we've ever pushed an audience in that regard. Um, so when we were building that, it was engineered where it is always the performer's game. And most often it's such a heightened kind of place that, that people do exactly what you did and kind of like freeze and wait for their cues, which is exactly what we want them to do. And that um, the game is, it's my move. As a performer, it's always my move. And if you, like I can honor your choices, I can honor some of the, the more subtler negotiations that you may have, but if you make a move, the game stops. And it's, it's, it's been very clear, and we've been very lucky so far that it is 
uh, it's one of those things that if an audience understands the rules, they know what to do. If the rules are clear, they will they will behave within the spirit of the piece. Mm. Um, if the rules are unclear, that's when you get crazy behavior, or if they come in really drunk or whatever. Have you had to deal with? We drunk we have, and and that's identified and communicated throughout the world. Like heads up, this person just you know they're opening doors. They're already breaking rule number one. Keep an eye on them. And so uh, oftentimes, like, we can route them to the least sort of, you know, provocative sort of place. And then other times they're pulled aside and given warnings. Like our stage management team, there, there is supervision in every area. Um, it is really, really subtle and unseen by the audience, but everything has, um, has safeties in place. And if people, you know, we have a system, our own system of... Um, how far is too far? What what is participation and what is disruption? Mm -hmm. And that gets defined very clearly for people. And uh, yeah, we've we've had people that we've pulled out and we said, "This is your warning again, and you're out." And we've kicked people out, not very many, um, but we've had to do it. Mm -hmm. And and certainly the actor safety is is of utmost importance to us. So um, yeah, and just in answer to the, that question, like. Uh, the actor safety is the most important, and so there there will be sometimes where like somebody I think we kicked somebody we've kicked so few people out I think because we established a a world in which we are offering as opposed to interacting at them um, so most of the time people are people are on incredible behavior mm -hmm. but there are times when you know somebody like walked into the scene and just started freaking out. Um, like banging on the doors, and we were just like, "Ed, you go home now. Mm -hmm. You go home." Like, uh, because it is our our performer safety is first. The other audience member safety is first, um, and you can't disrupt another audience member's experience. I have to say, and, and, uh, and my experience at, uh, at Grand Paradise was was that the, the audience was. I mean, I wish audiences at other plays were as, as well behaved as the audience that I saw. This <laughs> so I wish. No one. I, I checked my bags and my coat, and I inadvertently had my cell phone on on me, and I did not at once have the urge because there's a little there's downtime from time to time in this piece. You're left alone, and and I never once had the urge to take my phone out. And it was the night of the it was the night of the New Hampshire primary, and I, I was like you know normally I'd be like oh, who's winning, but I just you know and I did not the entire time see a single cell phone out, and I think that is a real testament to. The aud your audiences as well, sort of like being willing to follow the rules and also the way the rules are so clearly established. There's a lot of, the night I was there, there was a lot of respect and there was a lot of willingness. And I think that that doesn't happen often. And, and that's, uh, that's, that's, that's to your great credit, I think, uh, as creators. Do we have any other questions in the audience? In the back. Are you in the back? I saw you, we can get, we get one more. And then, do we have any Howl questions? Okay. So the question was, uh, uh, how does the greater sphere of where you're working affect our, affect your process? Um, in terms of we we create work in New York, but then when we're creating work in other spaces, what um, how does that affect it? Um, I think a lot of it um, actually comes from the years of work as site specific artists. Um, one of our practices is to walk into a space and and do sort of this amazing. Uh, method that Tom has developed, um, which is called the site exploration, where we're really listening to the site, we're looking at the architecture, we're looking at what we call the topography, um, which is cultural, social, um, architectural, historical, and really listening to everything that is about that site. And so for Denver, um, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with my amazing, uh, with my amazing producing and presenting team here about sort of like, you know, what are the things that what are the things that right now Denverites love to do? What are the things that aren't available here? What are the things that what are the things that are most popular? What are the things that feel like they're lacking? What are the things that uh, what are the experiences that people in Denver don't have? And one of our artists, as she was thinking about this, was like, you know what? 
isn't happening in Denver a lot in really small claustrophobic spaces, which is totally like, you know, all we deal with in New York. Um, uh, but we're like, oh, right, make a bunch of tiny rooms. Denverites don't spend a lot of time in broom closets. We're used to it, but, um, you know, so it's, it's that. It's about, it's really about listening, um, listening both locally and then, you know, sort of, you know, a little bit more regionally. Is there a Denver-specific component to the piece that you're making, or is it a little more universal? Um, uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, it is definitely, so? it is definitely Denver-specific, at least for me, because uh, because of my point of entry into it. But I think it is also informed by all of these things. It's, um, you know, in listening to the city, um, you know, what are, what are the offerings that we want to give to, you know, yes. What is the song that I want to sing to, to my hometown? Right. Well, I'll take a how round question. Uh, so the, quite the how round question was what uh, for those uninitiated in this this type of experience, what kind of advice do you give to your your potential audiences? Show up early and wear comfortable shoes. <laughs> um, really, the two most important. And then, um, I, I mean, at least for our work, I would I would say just um, just breathe. It's like we're going to take really good care of our audience, so. You don't have to know a lot, you just have to, um, I think you just have to be, you just have to show up. You just have to show up and wear comfortable shoes. Um, <clears throat> I think that's true of life too, I think. Yeah. That really is life boiled down to the essentials. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, I maybe think you can say something more I think we are done. Oh. Does anybody have a, like, just a, one question they have? Yes. One last question and we are finished. Basically, the question is, with such small audiences, how do you make any money? Uh, that, is, that is a perennial question. <laughs> um, uh, the, the, answer is, um, the answer is that Third Rail, um, the way that our organization is structured is a lot like the way that we structure every piece. Um, we sort of look at, look at the challenges of, of a particular model and then figure out how to, how to make it work. We're right now, um, we are an almost entirely artist-run company. Um, the three are co artistic directors are, um, are the executive directors, um, our managing director, our business director, our associate artistic director. Um, all of these people are also the artists with whom we work. Um, and so, so our organizational model has likewise been sort of built from the ground up. It's been re-envisioned to be able to support the kind of work that we make. Um, and to be able to deal with those questions of how do you have a small audience. Um, and some of it is that, um, that our ticket prices are a little bit higher than, than what they might be for, um, for work that's like this, but also we're offering, we also offer a lot for those ticket prices. So, so it, it really is that balance, that navigation. Um, and, and just, again, we, we kind of listen to the cultural moment that we're in and try to figure out how to respond to it. Thank you both. Uh, uh, on behalf of uh, the Denver Center, I'm so happy that you're here. I'm so grateful to have had this opportunity to talk to you guys. This is just, I've been so looking forward to sitting down with you both. Uh, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs>